Hi, so I'm colloquially known as Footleg in the tech world. <laughs> um, real name Paul, but there's a lot of Pauls, so uh, Footleg is less confusing for, for who I am. Um, I'm going to give you a run through of kind of how to how to get started with building a robot with a Raspberry Pi. So you've got your Raspberry Pi, fantastic piece of kit for very little cost. Um, Bill mentioned that you can get a kind of starter kit. They've recently been selling them from the Raspberry Pi Press for 25 quid for a Raspberry Pi and an SD card, which is kind of a bargain price. It also comes with the Getting Started book. Um, so that's about as cheap as you'll find a Raspberry Pi anywhere. Um, so you've got your Raspberry Pi, a really capable computer. Um, and one of the great things about them is that they have all these pins on that you can connect up to other electronics and you can kind of extend them. Um, and a great way of doing that is to extend them to drive motors um, and make them mobile and turn them into a robot. But there's a problem. It's attached to an awful lot of wires. And we've got to get rid of all of those if we're going to drive it around the room. Um, we also need some way of actually driving the motors. The Pi itself doesn't have enough power coming out of those pins to drive a motor. So what we need to do is add on a motor driver board. There's a lot of them on the market. Uh, these are some of the ones which I've used. Um, I particularly like the Pecon Zero um, because it will drive um, a pair of motors and also up to six servos. You can drive LEDs, the programmable strips of LEDs that you can light out lots of different colors all off the one board. Um, there's also a similar one by the same um, firm, Fortronics, which also has power regulation. I'll, I'll come back to what that's all about. Um, and then if you want to kind of add on other electronics and build your little circuits on a breadboard, the um, Explorer Hat Pro also comes with, um, you see the numbers around the edge, the numbers one to eight, they're all capacitive touch. So you can use those as kind of switches by just, you put your finger on and the code can tell that you've, been, uh, that you've, you've kind of touched them. Um, and there's the CamJam Edgy Kit, which is a kind of about the lowest cost robotics kit that you'll find. You can buy them in the Raspberry Pi shop in Cambridge um, and you kind of build the robot out of the cardboard box that the kit comes in. Um, they're a great starter kit. That's actually how I got started into Raspberry Pi. Um, I bought a £4 Raspberry Pi Zero and a CamJam Edgy Kit 3. Um, and I think all, all I had to do was add an SD card and a battery. Um, we had, we had a working robot. So, once you've got your robot, there's kind of two ways of controlling it. One is to use this kind of tank steering mechanism where you just, if you drive one motor forwards and one backwards, it kind of spins. And so you can use that for, for what we call skid steering or tank steering. For some reason my mouse is not talking to the laptop. The other mechanism is to use a type of motor called a servo. And a servo is a motor that you can actually instruct to go to a specific position. Normally they have a 180 degree kind of range. You can get ones that can turn all the way around, but most common ones. So you program it to kind of go to position 90 and it will go there and stay there, I would say 180. Um, and, and that is a great way of controlling like a steering rack on a robot. So, how are we going to get rid of all these wires? The first one is your keyboard and mouse. Um, and one option is to just get one of these little USB dongle wireless keyboard and mice. You can see the little dongle stuck in the USB port. Um, and now I've got a kind of remote controller for the Raspberry Pi. Um, and we've gone wireless. Another option is to use game controllers. They're a little bit more complicated on the coding side because you have to actually run a program that can interface to a game controller. Um, I've written a library that um, is kind of a robotic, all my robots are based on the, the kind of template code, um, which is, I'll have a link at the end um, if anyone wants to kind of download it and use it. It's um, fairly self-documented um, and it will talk to most of the game controllers. Um, on the market. Um, the only ones it doesn't talk to at the moment are the Xbox ones, and that's because I haven't got one to, to kind of work out which buttons code to which inputs. Uh, at some point I'll get my hands on one and, and add that support for that. 
Um, we need to lose the screen. That video cable and a, and a TV is going to hamper our robot's mobility. So um, how are we going to do that? One option is to use the real VNC remote desktop connect that, that Bill mentioned in his talk. Um, so this is a mechanism to actually get your Raspberry and desktop of your Raspberry Pi loaded on a laptop over the Wi-Fi, and then the laptop acts as your complete kind of Raspberry Pi interface. But actually what you're doing is you're just seeing a window onto what's running on the Raspberry Pi. So for now, you're completely wireless, except the Pi needs power still. And that's easily solved with a battery. But a laptop's kind of a fairly cumbersome thing to be carrying around. Um, so another alternative. Oh, of course, you need Wi-Fi as well. Um, and that's great when you're kind of at home and you connect to the home Wi-Fi. But then you come to a venue like this and to reconfigure everything to talk to the Wi-Fi. Or you're in a tent in a field at a kind of event somewhere demoing your robots. Um, what I use is an old BT home hub um, that was left over when I upgraded my broadband a few years back. So all of my Raspberry Pi cards are configured to connect to that Wi-Fi router. And then I just take that with me. It's not on the internet, but all of my Pis can talk to each other through it. So it's a really quick, cheap way of making everything portable and taking your network with you. And then you can get a lot of increasing numbers of really nice little screens that you can program from the Raspberry Pi. Some of them actually kind of a high enough resolution to put the whole desktop on. Um, if you've seen the, the big Mars Rover robot, the kind of A4 size Mars Rover robot I've got on the uh, show and tell table out there, that's got a touch screen which is big enough to actually kind of code on. Um, I have to wear my reading glasses, but it's, it's kind of, it, it's a big enough uh, screen to, to kind of operate the robot through should I need to. Um, you can also get these ones, which isn't a touch screen, but it has four buttons down the side, so you can write a menu and visually indicate on the screen. And then they, they kind of get smaller and smaller in size, um, so they're great for kind of showing status information and um, enough information to give you some kind of visual feedback without needing um, a TV monitor or computer monitor attached. And the final option is to just do away with the screen altogether, because your robot has ways of communicating with you that don't require a screen. Um, you can put some LEDs on it. This is a kind of um, eight LED strip that, um, from Pi Moroni, which is plugged onto the, um, the GPIO outputs. The Pecon Zero hat, which I talked about earlier, um, and a splitter so that I can have two attachments added on the Pi at the same time. Um, you can mix lots and lots of attachments for the Raspberry Pi, but not all. So there's a great website called pinout.xyz um, and you look up the hat and it tells you which of the 40 pins it uses and then you can see which other hats you might be able to use with it because as long as they don't use the same pins for their communication then they'll work together with these splitters. Um, so the LEDs are a great way of giving some kind of visual impact. So this robot, while it's waiting for me to turn on a, a PlayStation controller and for it to pair over Bluetooth, it lets me know that it's waiting by doing a little kind of light display. And then when it detects the Bluetooth controller, it lights up green to say we're all ready to go. You've also got your motors. Um, so some of my simpler robots, I just get them to kind of do a little jiggle. So they jiggle the steering while they're waiting for the controller. So the wheels are going, shh, 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 shh. I know that the controller's not turned on. So turn on the controller. When it detects it, it does a little kind of forwards, backwards. Um, lets me know. Um, there's also sound output. So you could add a speaker and get little speaker add-ons, or you can plug in a kind of a little battery-powered um, sort of um, speaker straight into the headphone port, and uh, your robot can talk to you then. Um, there's free speech, text-to-speech software that you can run on the Raspberry Pi, so you can, you can kind of make it give quite complex information over audio, or just a few beeps and squeaks like R2-D2. So finally, we need to solve the power. Um, really, really quick and simple way is to get a USB charger pack um, these ones that have kind of the, what I call a two cell, uh, they're nearly all based on the type of um, batteries called 18 um, 650s because they're 18 millimetres in diameter and they're 65 millimetres long. They're, they're uh, um, like a big chunky kind of double A battery, about twice the size. Um, and this will have two of them in, I can tell because it's twice as wide as it is tall. Uh, you can get ones that have one in. Um, 
the one cell ones often can't power up a lot in the raspberry, but they'll, they'll power the raspberry pi, but not the motors. These ones have actually got enough juice in to sometimes power small motors, um, but they'll run a raspberry pi all day and, and beyond. Um, another option is to use one of these circuits called a UBEC. That stands for Universal Battery Elimination Circuit. Um, they come from the remote control world where your remote control plane or helicopter or boat or whatever it is runs off 12 volts, but your radio control receiver circuit runs off 6 volts or 5 volts. Um, so rather than have to have a second battery for that lower voltage circuit, you put a UBEC in and it converts whatever voltage comes in to 5 or 6 volts. Um, and these have enough juice to run a Raspberry Pi um, and they're very cheap. These, this particular hobby wing one, you'll find them plenty of them online. You can buy them for about four quid if you want one tomorrow from Amazon or eBay um, from the UK. Or you can buy them for about pound twenty if you're prepared to wait six weeks for them to come on the slow boat from China. So what I tend to do is I buy ten of them from China <clears throat> and then they're sat in a box at home waiting for when I have a robot project and I don't have to wait six weeks. Some of the um, hats have power regulation built in, so you can plug your batteries, this says 7 to 10 volts DC, so you can plug your power into the power in jack and it will send a safe 5 volts to the Raspberry Pi. So um, they cost a little bit more, but you don't have to then have the extra wiring and of the UBEC circuit. Um, the other potential issue is controlled start up and shut down. Now start up is kind of all right, you plug the power in and the Pi boots up, but you want it to also run your robot code. So you need to, there's several ways to do this and I'm not going to go into the details here, but there's lots of online posts on how to run a program and start up on the Raspberry Pi. So when the Pi boots up, my, ro my robot code will run automatically. When I come to shut down, I could just pull the plug. Um, there is potentially a risk that if the SD card was being written to, that you could corrupt the file system. Although I've never in three or four years of running coding workshops with kids where the power gets pulled all the time because people turn off the socket blocks and all sorts. I've never had this happen. I've never had an SD card get corrupted. So kind of how likely it is to be a problem, I don't know. Um, but you can get this little board from Pi Moroni called an on-off shim, and it kind of sits in between your add-on hardware on the pins takes its power in and it has a little tiny push button, which is that um, little white thing on the top left. Um, so it doesn't power up till you press that button. It then sends power to the Pi and then it monitors one of the GPIO pins for a signal. And if you press the button again, then it will do a controlled shutdown of the operating system and cut the power off again. So they're a nice little add-on if you're worried about being able to kind of sh boot up and shut down. I built my first robot with one of them. And it works great, but I kind of haven't bothered since because I've never had a problem by just pulling the plug on them. Um, but I can't guarantee that is a, is a fail safe. So I mentioned the CamJam EduKit 3. Um, this is the one that I bought that started me off on Raspberry Pi. Comes with a couple of motors with wheels. Um, you bolt them onto the box or stick them onto the box. Um, and it has a little motor driver board, everything you need except the Raspberry Pi and the memory card and a battery um, to, uh, to get going. Slightly more sophisticated version is the STS Pi kit that Pi Moroni do. Um, you can see that it's got clips to hold a USB battery on the back. Um, it only holds the single cell round ones, um, but it enables you to, again to control two motors with the Explorer hat on top, takes a full-size Raspberry Pi. Um, it's got a mount on the front if you want to fit a Raspberry Pi camera. That's an addition, it's not included in the kit. But the basic robot chassis with the wheels and the motors um, is what you get in the kit. And that's another great kind of starter kit to build something that, that's a little bit more kind of solid, um, long-lasting than the, the, the cardboard box um, chassis. One of my favourite kits, because it's so capable, is the one that's actually designed by Brian, who was kind of up on the stage um, with his son Bill a minute ago. Um, it's a four-wheel drive version of the STS Pi, um, but with faster motors as well. So it's a bit more capable. And, and Brian designed it as the lowest cost kit that he could design 
that was capable of entering a competition like Pi Wars. So it's a nice, makes nice, capable robot. Um, and uh, it comes with everything except the Raspberry Pi and some form of power. So you still need to sort out batteries and um, getting power to the Raspberry Pi. I actually modified one of uh, the kits and put a micro bit motor controller board on it. So instead of the Raspberry Pi, I've got a micro bit motor controller board. Can plug a micro bit in, and then kids can program a micro bit um, to control the motors, and you can get the robot doing whatever they want to, to code. So that gives them a really quick drag and drop for, for kids working with micro bits. So it just shows you the versatility. You can see I've got the UBEC on there to um, give me a safe six volt supply to the motor driver hat that powers the micro bit safely um, and then underneath well, you can't see it sandwiched in between the layers i've got a couple of lithium cells giving me a sort of eight to seven and a half volt power source lego is a really versatile medium for designing and exploring engineering um, this was the early version of the robot that you might have seen driving around today um, again it's using a pecan zero um, motor driver and it's using the Lego power functions motors which are the ones that have the you can see up the top there's a kind of funny electronic Lego block um, that lets you kind of clip the things together um, the power function motors um, don't come with any kind of controlling electronics you can get a battery box with a switch and that's about it but if you buy one of the extension leads which is just kind of two of those blocks with a four wire thing in between cut the wire in half strip the ends I put a little bit of solder on them to make them a bit more robust but it's not essential the middle two wires are the ones that control the motor the outside two wires are for sending constant um, power to things like lights that you might add so uh, so all you need to do is just plug the two middle wires into the motor outputs on the motor driver board and you're up and running um, and then you can plug any of the lego motors on um, we use a servo at the front it's just a hobby servo completely unmodified um, I just built a Lego chassis shape that was big, just the right size for it to slot in um, and uh, it then engages with the steering rack this robot is a, moving a bit beyond kits um, the tracks and the base which has a four cell battery holder and the motors are mounted in it that all comes as a kind of chassis kit but you then have to decide what electronics you're going to put on. You might have to drill holes in the chassis to fit the mount, mounting holes for Raspberry Pi. Um, I actually, there's a sheet of Perspex in there, which in the days before I had access to a laser cutter, I just cut with a hacksaw um, and drilled very carefully um, four holes in it. Um, so it's got four holes for the Raspberry Pi and then another four holes that line up with the holes on the chassis. So it just acts as a mounting plate. So we can see those two robots in action. So you can see the game controllers controlling the steering and just the speed of the motor. And the other one. has just got the two motors, but by running them at different speeds, you can do curve, turn, in on the spot. So all of the code that's in those robots is in the examples for the game controller interface template that I mentioned earlier, um, which you can find on GitHub slash Footleg. You'll find all of my code, which is all published free for educational use and reuse. And open to questions. Um, yeah, there are some. There are some nice. I, I, I'd say. I mean, it depends whether you're talking on the making, building the robot side, or the coding side. 
Um, certainly for the coding, I'd say micro bits is a really good way to go if they're in the kind of six to eight yeah. age range. Uh, they'll, get, they'll get results much quicker. They will need some help with writing the motor interface bit of code. Um, so I wrote a library that kind of has a bunch of code functions preloaded in it. So you open that project up and then you've got custom blocks that are kind of motors forwards, backwards, turn left, turn right. And then they can start kind of playing with that. Um, the, there are a number of nice micro bit kits or you can do what I did and stick a micro bit motor board on top of any of the robot kits on the market. Because at the end of the day, all of these have just got kind of one or two motors and you plug the motor wires into the motor output on the board and it lets you control the speed of the motor and the direction. So, yes? So most of the kits will have links to instructions online. Um, so they will all take you through some coding to get you up and running. Um, and um, you can either kind of follow their instructions. Um, they may not get you up and running with a game controller, for example. They may just show you how to do keyboard control. Um, or you can go to a code library like the one I've written, which, again, you find online. Um, and that will work with most of the kit. So any of the board, motor controller boards that I've played with, I've added an example in my library, and you can load that example up and see something that will drive motors on that. Um, the robot arm that you might have seen out on my show and tell stand is also using the same library. So it's just controlling four servos instead of um, motors, but it's just another type of robot. Yes. Um, I bought the Lego motors directly from the Lego website because, strangely enough, they're cheaper there than they are from anywhere else. So I was looking on an Amazon thinking, oh, I'll be able to buy Lego motors cheap on Amazon. And the people were selling them for like 15, 30 quid. And then I looked on lego.com and they were selling them for, I think, eight quid. So I bought the motors directly from Lego. Any other Lego is more expensive to buy directly from Lego's website. But the, the Power Functions motors... The, the cheapest the place I found them is directly from Lego. Have you ever looked at Vex robotics? Um, I've seen Vex stuff. It looks really sophisticated. I've heard it's not particularly cheap. But beyond that, I don't have any experience of it. Yeah, I've seen some kind of big display stands. At, uh, I think it was an airport I saw one in, where there was a huge kind of very sophisticated looking set of Vex. Likewise, Lego Mindstorms so it makes a really amazing educational kit, but your starting price is kind of like 150 to 250 quid for a Mindstorm setup. Whereas this was, I think I paid 15 quid for the motor and the, um, and the extension wire, um, and uh, the servo was a fiver. So I kind of had, for, for about 25 quid, I had all the parts to make a robot. Yes, yeah, I've, I've come across Vex's competitions. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, how much would you say a Lego motor would cost on Pomeroni? So Pomeroni don't sell Lego motors, but they do sell adapters that let you adapt the other the types of motors in the other two robots. are called micro metal gear motors. I don't think I've got a photo of one, um, but they're they're a little motor with a gearbox. Um, and Pimeroni sell a little adapter that lets you plug an e a Lego axle onto one of those motors so you can then fit the nice, because Lego do lots of nice, interesting wheels, rubber tyres and things. Um, so if you've already got a load of Lego, that's another way to control it from a Raspberry Pi. Yeah. Do you have any suggestions for the next step up from those little micro metal motors? Um, we want something a little bit bigger. So more power, more speed, bigger size, what's the... Yeah, all of that. All of it. Um, so Pi Borg sell a really nice range of motors. Um, they're kind of slightly chunkier. They have higher power requirements. So um, 
you need to make sure that whatever motor you buy is matched to the current that your motor driver chip can handle. So the bigger motors will have more of a current draw. Um, a cheap motor controller, if you attach it to a big motor, will go up in smoke because the motor will try and draw more current than the chip can handle. A lot of these actually self-regulate. So if you ask for three amps from a controller that can only handle two, then it just gives you two. So it kind of, the motor might not drive very fast, but it, nothing bad happens, but the, it's not guaranteed. So what you need to look up for the motor is the stall current. That's how much current the motor will draw if the wheels stopped from turning, which happens when your robot crashes into a wall or gets tied up in the washing or something. And um, that current is the current that that motor driver chip has to handle in order to, to not kind of cope. So your motor hardware gets more expensive because you have to buy a board that has a higher current rated drivers. But the, other, the rest of the principles are all the same. So I'd recommend Pi Borg. Um, I think the Pi Hut are now the kind of outlet for, um, so if you go to thepihut.com, you'll find they sell a good range of chunkier motors and wheels and adapters to go with them. So yeah. Uh, yeah, so the people who kind of build the sort of combat motors, they, uh, drill motors is a common one. So the, the cordless drill motors for making really kind of... But, but you're starting to talk then about robots that can cause serious harm if you get your fingers caught in them, for example. So we've gone from toy to kind of mechanical beast. So uh, uh, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's sort of just be aware of the safety implications of building something that can spin something that fast um, is that... You're responsible for the safety implications. Yeah. And, and often you, you, can, you can go down... So the micrometal gear motors, I've got a robot that's out um, on the show and tell table, which looks just like Brian's kit, but I've put the high-power versions of the motors in. So instead of the motors costing five quid each, they cost 15 quid each. So four motors, you've already spent 60 quid. But if you can give them enough power then they go really fast. Um, and that robot's really good fun to drive. Um, so you don't necessarily have to go bigger. To Now, because they're very fast motors, they're, they're fast because the gearbox is a lower ratio. It spins the wheel faster. They haven't got a huge amount of drive. So you try and drive it up a slope, and, and it struggles. But you get it going on the flat, and it, it goes off like a rocket. Yes? Well, I drove here today in a car that's electric drive, so it's basically no different, yeah? It's no different to this robot here. The front wheels steer with a steering rack, and the back wheels steer with an electric motor. So they're already out on the road. So yeah, if you can get your dad to buy you an electric car motor and enough batteries, you could really make a powerful go-kart. I'm sure it'll be very educational. <laughs> Not with any cars. Okay, um, we're kind of at the end of the time slot, so thank you for coming to my talk. If anyone's got further questions, I will be out on the show and tell stand until we close for the day. You can come and play with the robots there. And uh, thank you for coming to the Cambridge Jam. <laughs>